In this video, I'll, I'll go into a little more detail on how to cultivate the habits and skills of autonomy. So when children get into their uh, young adulthood, they're making wise choices about their life. Um, You'll remember that when we talk about autonomy, as it might be known in a, a young adult, mid to late teens, early 20s, it means I'm making choices about my life that are going to help me to grow and are going to be impactful to the people around me. And the goals I set and the challenges I embrace and the choices I make, they're mine. I own them and I take personal responsibility for what I do and how I do it and how it might affect other people. And so these choices are going to be aligned also with my understanding of myself and that changes over time. So autonomy is a little bit of an evolutionary process as well across the span of life. Who I am and what I am and how I'm related to other people for their betterment and all my choices, I understand the responsibilities to myself and to those people around me. You'll recall, this is not freedom to do whatever you want to do. I know that's the common understanding of freedom in our country. Um, this is autonomous freedom, which is thoughtful. It's reflective. It's built on critical thinking skills, whereby I derive choices that are the best for me at any given point in time. That's going to change over the course of our life for me and for others. Uh, despite external influences and the pressures that I might face as a young adult, my approach toward life and my decisions about life are built upon internal convictions and an internal value system that informs and empowers my growth. Now, this educational momentum that we've been defining education to be uh, that fuels autonomy also relies on the principles of the early start and the cumulative advantage. That's, that is when habits and skills are cultivated early in life and, can, and persist, then over a course of time, there is a cumulative advantage with young people uh, when they face their teen years, they, they develop the kinds of skills to make them successful. All right, so what needs to happen uh, in order to build up this momentum toward uh, self-autonomy? Um, the role of the educator becomes what I'm going to call a partner for choice or a partner in choice. That's your role uh, to practice what I call a kind of co-choosing with children. We, we partner with them on how to choose. Um, as a partner, we educate a child's thought process that wrestles with what choices should be made and why those choices should be made. This is education on how to choose well how to choose so that the child will be on a pathway to realize his or her potential and on a pathway to be a factor in the betterment of, of their world. So as educators, I, I'm sure you know well, there's a, there is a culture outside of our homes, outside of our schools, outside of our protective bubble of our children that has a powerful influence on the children. And in this environment, in this cultural environment, it continually challenges our children and gives them reasons to shun, if not completely ignore, a pathway of growth, choose other things to focus their life on other than their own improvement. That culture does not help children make good choices. That culture does not hold or support or promote a mindset for growth and thriving. So you have to realize these pressures push on our children all the time. And it's our responsibility, the educator, the teacher educator, the parent educator, the coach educator, by being a partner in and for choice to establish a pathway for our children that reaches, causes them to reach higher and a better life. All right, so what, what exactly is a partner in choice? Uh, first, the partner in choice recognizes that in order for a young person to become autonomous at some point in time, they first need a rich, deep, expansive, and even inspiring accumulation of knowledge and experiences. You see, good choices in life need to be informed. How can I decide what's best for me if I don't know the choices that are available to me? So it's that knowledge base that we draw from that helps us make good decisions in the future. So consequently, this is gonna be interesting, although we're talking about choice, the younger a child is, 
the less choices they have, or I should say they need mostly guided choices. I mean, that's beside what kind of ice cream do you want or what kind of a birthday party do you want? I guess they could have whatever choice they want on that. Um, but younger children, they're not equipped uh, to make good choices about their life. Nearly everything they choose is going to be based on how they feel. That's to be expected. Autonomous wisdom, however, is built on a foundation of knowledge. It's built on a foundation of experiences. It's built on a foundation of values, particular to one's culture that's in one's family, and on a wealth of stories that they can draw from uh, to become a wise adolescent and a, an adult who makes their choices, again, based on this reservoir of positive knowledge and experiences. Very young children do not need to make the choice whether they should read good books or whether they should study their mathematics or whether they should understand history and world cultures or whether they should be competent writers or treat their classmates with respect and kindness. These are not choices a young person is equipped to make. Um, when a child says, I don't like math, I don't wanna do math, I don't like science, I don't wanna do science, I don't like social studies, I don't wanna do <laughs> on and on and on and on. Um, instead, the partner in choice needs to be firm and say, listen, you know, honey, um, you are going to do this, you're going to do it very well to the best of your ability. And now here's where the partner in choice is a little bit different. I'm going to explain to you over and over again, why, why what I'm asking you to do is important now and for the remainder of your life. Um, so we co-choose with them, kind of forced choice in these case when the children are younger, but we're choosing and we're teaching them how to have the body of knowledge from which they can make good choices. Um, we explain why certain activities and learning are important to their life. And then we insist on compliance. Uh, otherwise we're limiting their resources for making wise choices in the future. Children, as I said, just do not have sufficient life experiences to understand what are evidently the best choices for them. Wisdom in choice emerges from knowledge and experience. And the more their knowledge and experience expands, well, then the wiser and smarter will be their exercise of autonomy when they get older. Without good knowledge, the foundation of rich experience and stories, children will make choices, and this is important, that will not benefit their growth, but may actually limit their growth in the long run. Of course, as children mature, and I'll talk about how to work with them as they mature in just a little bit, um, as they discover more and more about themselves, their interests, their talents, their abilities, um, and as their experiences expand, and I mean positive, constructive, interesting educational experiences, uh, we, the educators, the teachers, parents, coaches, can expand choice options. Now, how do we go about building a knowledge base of experiences? Uh, the choices we give children should become meaningful to them. Everything they do, we want to make it meaningful. Although this term meaningful could be relative, at the very least, each experience should engage children's learning, providing real world experiences and requiring children to reach some level of mastery. Because in this, in this, when they have reached some level of mastery in, in any subject that they do, any activity that they do, um, they get a taste, a little taste of that subject matter of a breath of in intellectual endeavors that tastes good. It's good to read. It feels good to write, but it has to be a meaningful experience that this kind of, they get this derivative of joy from the things that they learn. And it will res someday, certain one of these experiences are going to resonate with their personal uh, personalities, um, their interests and likes, and then it can inform decisions in the future. A child cannot learn to be a writer when they're in their 20s if they have not tasted some enjoyment of writing as they went through elementary, middle, and high school. Now, the responsibility for meaningful learning really rests on both the educator and the student. 
Uh, it's up to the educator to provide rich experiences of subject matter that stimulate interest and awakens potential talent. And in future videos, I'll talk about this in more depth. But on the other hand, then, it's up to the student to engage in subject matter purposefully and completely to do your work and to do it well. This is engagement. It's not half-hearted participation from which you get nothing. So this kind of engagement will help children once again discover the value of each and every subject, which in turn will enable them to make informed decisions later in life. Both parties have responsibility if educational choices are to be a part of the educational foundation from which children can make decisions later on in their life. Well, this requires time and commitment. It requires an honest effort and measurable achievement. If this criteria is not met, then children will do school. They'll do their math, uh, they'll get it done, they'll get their writing done, um, and often will ch we'll, children will say, I did that. I get this all the time in my math classes. Oh, I, di I did that page already. I did that already. Um, meaning they got the assignment done. They passed middle school. They passed high school. They got it done. But they're not immersed in subject matter. They didn't make discoveries in the courses that they took. They didn't taste the excitement embedded in every school subject. So they really didn't learn anything. Consequently, it doesn't mean anything to them. Uh, it doesn't affect them. And this is not learning. It's not going to play a part when they begin to make choices about what's best for their life. So as children mature, then educators function as a partner in choice needs to make little incremental adjustments. And this one's very, very important. I've watched this for years. And if you miss the adjustments, whether you're a teacher or whether you're a parent, you can cause your, yourself a lot of frustration as well as your son or daughter. The role of partner of choice shifts. The educator needs to become almost more like a friend. And I don't mean to lose your, your sense of responsibility and authority with your children, but it becomes almost where you're a friend. And usually as children grow older, it's only natural. They wanna make their own decisions um, without parent or teacher input. And the role of partner in choice has to change. Here, the partner in choice helps the student or the child draw upon the years of experience they have, the values that they've accumulated over time, and then to think about the choices that they have. The guidance through the process of making good choices is more than the outcome, which is a good choice. That's where the coaching takes place, walking them through the process. As young people mature, they need training and support. How to think about making good choices. It doesn't just happen. It needs to be nurtured. And then how to derive decisions that will lead to their growth and their impact on the world around them. That process is something where they need a partner who talks with them, a friend. Well, this is hard work for the partner in choice uh, because if you remain in a top-down authority position, you're gonna lose your, your posture as a partner in choice. You're gonna be on the outside looking in uh, with little influence over your children except to a demand obedience. And that often results in children's rebellion. They just don't wanna listen anymore. Um, remember, as children mature, they, they want to do it. They want to do it on their own. This does not mean, however, that you cannot play an influential role, key influential role. Um, but that role is now to help them learn how to think about how to make good choices. So we do. We position ourselves as a friend with them. Uh, we listen to them. We give them a chance to exercise their thought process. Then we ask a lot of questions and we might challenge how they're thinking and we might challenge the way they're approaching something um, and whether or not it's rising, their decisions are rising to the level of being a beneficial for their growth and for that of their friends. From my experience, children love this kind of partnership. You honor them, you respect them, you listen to them, 
and then very carefully and wisely ask them questions, the same way you'd ask questions of yourself when you're making similar kinds of decisions. Partners in choice value the process of thinking together like a partner, like a friend. And then you got to let the reins go. Um, it, it depends on the age that you have to know by the children you're working with when you can let them go or let them make choices because sometimes the choices are going to be bad. And that's a part of life. I don't care how old you are. We still make bad choices um, and we take responsibility for them but they have to learn they've got a friend, they've got a partner, someone guiding them in those, those decisions that they have to make. And we know mistakes may come. Now, the second thing uh, that the partner of choice or the partner for choice is to pass on is a value system. That kind of undergirds decisions, what I believe, what I hold. Um, so when they make choices in life, those choices are driven by reason values, uh, which they learn from the educator, that's the parent or the teacher, what we believe about setting goals and about hard, hard work and about perseverance and resilience and about kindness and compassion for others. We're, we're infusing them of these kind of values. Um, it supports reason choices, which enhance personal growth and considers what is best for the people around me. Now, unlike a good math course or a good writing course, you cannot just learn values in a course. Good values are inculcated over time. And this is going to be the job of the partner in choice. They're nurtured through co-choosing, through being a friend and talking through these things. That is making choices with children during and through which the process, you are explaining your cultural and family values, and how they apply to the choices you are making together. Hard work, self-discipline, delayed gratification, compassion, and justice. I'm not talking about values related to social, political, or even religious topics. I'm talking about what we would consider and is considered natural virtues um, that are respected um, globally and across time and space. Uh, the, but children need to hear these value systems over and over and over again. They're nurtured through instruction, uh, through modeling your own and pointing out models that are, are in your sphere of influence through stories. And each lesson, each model that we hold up to the children, each story that we tell them about hard work and perseverance and people of compassion and people of kindness is like a coat of values paint. You spread a coat of paint on them that educates a child on how to look at the world in a productive manner. So this value guidance is persistent, it's consistent, and it is enduring over a long period of time. You may repeat the same lessons over and over and over again and wonder to yourself, when are they going to get it? It doesn't matter. Um, it seems like there's no effect, you know. Often we say, well, I told them that already. Uh, it doesn't matter. The effect over and over and over again speaks to their heart and to their conscience. And it's a painting that occurs over a long period of time. That paint may chip. You know, you may see when your son is or daughter or, or students are out of high school and they're in college and they do things and you think to yourself, how, where did you learn that from? Well, that's just what happens. There's a chip in the paint, but the, but the issue is lifelong lessons imparted consistently over time, they're effective. They speak to them long into the future. Every, every sort of reminder of good moral conduct is just another layer of paint. How are you supposed to work? How do you treat other people? How do you interact with your friends at school? How do you interact with your teacher? These are lessons that needed repeated hundreds, maybe thousands of times, and every time it's a coat of paint. But when these lessons are administered in kindness and in love and in tenderness, not, not authoritatively or why aren't you like this, but over and over again, gently, kindly, but repeatedly and persistently, the paint, the values paint, seeps deeper and deeper into the wood. And whether you can see it or not, 
uh, um, your practice of being a partner in choice, of co-choosing, of communicating in a kind, loving, friendly, but directive way with children, your incessant reminders of good behavior will have an enduring effect on how students or your son or your daughter exercise their productive, autonomous living in their young adult life. I hope this is helpful. Thank you.